Good afternoon and welcome to another Got Safety presentation here. And uh, I am Rick Roman, your host, along with Michael Crowley. Michael, good yes. afternoon to you. Oh, uh, Rick, I long for the day, Rick, where we can be in the same room together, Rick, sharing each other's company again, Rick. Well, are we, are we close to the end of this, sir? We're very, we're coming very close. In fact, for those of you who uh, normally we don't do back to back webinars so That's close, but we've one, actually yeah. uh, California passed some new regulations, and uh, we're going to be having a, a webinar on that tomorrow as well. So hopefully, you guys are able to attend that uh, if you're in California or have locations in California. So yes, we will soon be able to uh, get back to our usual single room for broadcasting but uh in the meantime here as we wait for folks to get into the room here yeah, yeah. um just want to remind you that if you have any questions type them into the chat we will be answering questions at the end um, there will be a replay so if you've registered you'll automatically get a uh, a, a link emailed to you later this afternoon with the replay um, and we will have presentation slides that you'll be able to download here from the presentation. Mm -hmm. Rick, we are two of the best looking guys in safety <laughs> broadcasting stuff, aren't we, Rick? Well, I, I don't know about that, but, uh, are you, are you kidding me? As we wait for people to come to the group, Rick, I mean, who else is doing safety webinars that are better looking than you and I, sir? Well, I'm. I haven't really looked at too many, so I can't tell you. But uh, I, I agree with you. That's probably the right choice. <laughs> anyway, let me go ahead and uh, and bring the presentation up so we can yes. go ahead and get started here. We got folks going to be uh, busy, I'm sure. So let's get my screen up here. Uh, right to the point, Rick. Always keeping us on track, sir. That's probably the right choice. And there we go. Heat so to, Yes, sir. So today we are talking about heat illness prevention. It's kind of a two-topic webinar. We're talking about heat illness prevention as we get into the hot time of the year here right now, mm -hmm. and also about OSHA-required safety program documentation. So let's get moving with that here. The first part of it here, we are going over the heat illness prevention. Now, there are states that actually require programs and have rules and regulations specific to heat illness, such as California and Washington. Um, Nevada actually has a written proposal that is being looked at. They soon will have something. Um, I can tell you that there have been talks on a national basis. So eventually there'll be something coming federally. Uh, it's hard to imagine that Arizona doesn't already have something as hot as it gets over there. Um, but uh, the, even in California, prior to the COVID, there were talks about indoor heat illness and it kind of got tabled, but I'm sure that's going to come back around. Yep. But that being said, even though some of the things we're going to be talking about are actually rules in California, uh, they make good sense and could probably be used anywhere you are where your employees are subject to, to working in the heat. So we're going to be going over training, uh, climatization, water provisions, shade provisions, cool down rest periods, and emergency response procedures. So the first part, speaking of training, is the supervisors. It. So when it comes to your supervisors, it's very important that they are aware of certain things and know what to look for and what to do when it comes to the employees. The first thing is, and we'll talk a little bit more about the acclimatization, but they got to make sure that they're allowing employees to acclimatize to the weather conditions, uh, how to recognize uh, heat symptoms yep. and uh providing training for the employees on heat illness prevention. prevention. Uh, they got to be aware of the environmental risk factors. So there's a lot of things that come into play, like the temperature, humidity, is there movement in the air? So even though it might not be as hot, if it's humid, it's, it's going to have more effect. And then also you got to look at personal things such as, you know, the, the age of the person, do they take medications, what kind of PPE they're wearing. All of these factors really make changes in your decisions. Um, they got to monitor employees for symptoms of heat illness, uh, making sure they're taking breaks. And, and making sure they're consuming water. They got to know when they got to uh, 
provide the shade and we'll talk about that and water as well and then they got to do weather monitoring so that they're aware of when these conditions are coming so that they can be prepared and then of course there's high heat procedures uh, for when the temperatures get real hot and then emergency for dealing with an employee who may expose uh, be having some symptoms or if they need to call help. Any thoughts on any of that for supervisors, Michael? Well, Rick, I tell you, for the supervisors, this is key for you guys to have under your belts an acknowledgement of how to recognize symptoms. I cannot tell you how many times we have people that are drinking these energy drinks, no name brands. You know, we do love all energy drinks, but they're drinking these energy drinks down right and left, and they don't really understand they're being dehydrated. Now, one of the easiest ways, and it has some problems with it, but one of the easiest ways are these two posters that we've put together, and you'll see the one with the sun on it where it says identifying symptoms. Symptoms. These are a list of all the symptoms that could be. You've got to have this in a spot where your employees really can see the symptoms on a daily basis. You can do training once a month or once a season, but this is a great way. These posters are free. Is that correct, Rick? They're free? They are free. They're available okay. in your God Safety Client yes. Center, and they should be popping up here uh, for you to actually be able to download right here uh, from the presentation, yeah. English and Spanish. And what you find with the with the Stay Hydrated poster, I guess they both have suns at the top. That's funny. I was doing that. Where it has the urine chart at the bottom. Now, I know this is disgusting, and if you're the brown you're like okay dude you need to go see a doctor this is bad bad news but you've got to make sure you're this is a great way to gauge how dehydrated your body so if you don't feel any of the symptoms on the left side of your screen but you're looking at this going man but my urine is very dark this could be because you're dehydrated or you're like a, a vitamin junkie and you take a lot of crazy vitamins but remember your urine is should be to the good to moderate probably on a hot day. I don't think you're getting to excellent on a hot day unless you got an IV and you're sucking down liquid every second. But I'm saying to you, you want to really have this up. I like the urine chart inside of all the, the, the portable restrooms, the Andy Gumps or whatever brand you're using. You put that on the wall and you can do it. So you can print these. But if you do need me to print them on a sticker form where you can just slap them anywhere, there is a little cost there for me to print those for you. But we can print those and ship them out to you, no big deal. But yes, two posters that I think is great that the supervisors has got to be referring to so they can see that. Definitely, Rick. Exactly. So, Michael, when it comes to the employee training, we have resources for that as well. We do. And so right here, these bullet points you can see are a list of the lessons that we have for the employee training. You really want to cover these in a season, every season. The, the, the indoor workplace, if it's getting hot and what they're doing, because they may be less uh, aware of some of the things that come to it. One of the problems that we see every season is the acclimatization of it. Acclimatizing to the heat is really something you've got to really focus on. And Rick, we can talk about that a little later, but that is a lesson that you're really going to want to do. Because when it comes to the hydration, teaching them what they should and should not drink, these are things that really get the employee off to the right start. We've got these on video form, and we have them in Spanish in video form too, Rick, right? Am I right, yep, sir? of course. Yes, sir. Yeah. So as we go on here, Michael was just talking about the acclimatization, and usually most most problems that, that occur are early on in the season or when you get new employees and they haven't been out in those conditions or when it just starts getting hot, you, you really want to make sure as a supervisor that you're monitoring your employees during that 14-day period when they're first starting out. Because as you look at these pictures up at the top, just like the, the runners up there or the weightlifter wouldn't start out by running a marathon or lifting that type of weight. They got to build up to it. Well, so does your employee in working in the sun. Maybe if they're going to be out there where it's hot, you might be doing only a few hours a day, taking more breaks in between until they can build up and, and, and be able to, to make it through and, and working in, in those conditions. So you just got to make sure that you're really watching the, the weather to know when it's going to be hot like that and that you can uh, keep track of your guys and, and make sure that they're getting acclimatized to that. Uh, you find yourselves in this kind of world with us being such aggressive men and people in general that sometimes we look at the person who's trying to acclimatize and we're like, all right, come on, you got to man up or you got to put... But, you know, if we just give them a day or so to let their bodies get used to that heat, we can find that we can not just put off some very expensive 
uh, workers' comp claims, but we can save individuals. I cannot tell you over the years how many people we've had heat stresses, people that have died over this, where they're drinking the wrong drink comboed with they weren't even acclimatized to it, that their bodies just shut down. This can be a very, very bad system. So make sure, make sure people are acclimatized. Big, big. Yes, exactly. So the next thing is the water provisions, Michael. Water, let me tell you, you got to drink water. I know there's a lot of drinks out there, energy drinks, water with uh, electrolytes, which is great. But overall, you've got to provide water. So here's the thing that employers always ask me. Do I have to provide water to my employees, and does it have to be free of charge? The answer is yes. You as the employer must provide the water to them free of charge. If you have a tank of Gatorade out there that is cold as ice and beautiful, that does not qualify for the water. Remember, I'm not saying Gatorade is bad. I'm suggesting that when we say water, we're saying water. Now, here's the thing about this. You've got to have water that is fresh, pure, and suitably cool. Now, I did not just come up with those three words just out of thin air. Those are what's in some of the codes in, throughout the states uh, that have these high heat procedures, especially the Californians. And the logic to it is this is a tough one because suitably cool doesn't mean freezing ice, but it doesn't mean room temperature either. And fresh and pure, you know, you open up some of these jugs and guys have been dipping things in it and you can see floaties in the water. That won't be fresh and pure, I'm telling you. So that is is really what we're talking. And you should be able to provide a quart of water per employee uh, per hour. So those are the kinds of things that you're looking at. Um, you've just got to make sure you provide the water and have a, a time where you can replenish the water, right? Yes. Yeah, so then now I was just going to mention that that's key is having your supervisors being able to replenish and keep that up because yeah. depending on how many employees you have for an eight hour day, uh, that many quarts of water, you may not be able to have all that at once. So you may be at certain intervals having yeah. to go and refill and, and, and doing that. So you got to make sure your folks are monitoring that. And that's all part of the supervisor responsibilities. Yes, and, uh, <clears throat> So the next one here that we're looking at, Michael, is the shade. Shade is great. You got to have this shade. And the shade has got to be a portable if you're in an environment that you don't have shaded areas. But you've got to provide shade. So if you're in construction, if you're in agriculture or whatever, these shade pop-ups are really easy to do. I know they get blown around. The employees destroy them. But unfortunately, you do have to provide shade. And shade is not. Let's make sure. A, a tree shrub that can hold only two guys and you've got a 50-man crew out there. The shade has got to hold a decent amount of your employees at one time. And you can't say the words, well, I've got this car over here that is the shade. Listen, you're not running that car 24-7. And those cars can be hotter inside than it is. So you, you can't utilize that as the cool-down shade areas either. So yeah. uh, sorry to let you down if you're doing that. <laughs> yep. And you'll notice the, the 80 degrees on here and that's the second time that we've posted that number that is the number when in the states where there are rules regarding that that is the magic number where these things kick in so when it hits 80 degrees again the importance of monitoring the weather to know if you're going to need to have that stuff you better have this shade up mm -hmm. however if employ even if it's less than 80 degrees and employees request to take a break in the shade you still have to provide it but 80 degrees you better have it up and, and we're kind of telling everybody in the country this because we got a lot of clients on the East Coast. And the reason why we are, even though you don't have a necessarily an OSHA regulation that says 80 degrees is the magic number, the reality of it is it is still a good practice to yes. know on the top of your head. You really should keep it down. Right, it's 80 degrees today. We just want to make sure we don't have anybody that's organs start to shut down. Let's, you know, depending on what you do for work, let's think about some uh, adjustments that we can do. Exactly. All right, Whoops. Rick, we're going very nice here. We're going very good. Okay, so now we're talking about the uh, the cool down rest period. So uh, as Michael just talked about, that you have to have shade for them, but you also got to be making sure that these guys are taking breaks every once in a while, especially when you hit the high heat conditions, which is 95 degrees, which is what triggers high heat regulations. So that means there now it's, it's required that the, you give these guys a break where they can take a rest in the shade every two hours and, now, Rick, and let me stop you when you say required that's required in california correct yes it is required in california and but, then the rest of the country we we, we suggest that you mind yes. this or look towards this 
Correct. So at 95 degrees is is where, you know, it's getting pretty darn hot. When it's 95 out there, even if you're acclimatized, you want to be taking some breaks, drinking some water, getting in the shade and making sure you don't overheat themselves. But you want to make sure that they have a place to be able to take those breaks so that they can, you know, not only get a little bit of a rest, but more importantly, allow their body to cool down a little bit. And we're really talking about people that work directly in the sun constantly, right? I mean, in California, they have some of these other rules. But if you're like a roofer, you really need to have a spot where these guys on the roof doing what they do, and it's 110, 105, 100 degrees outside, you want to be mindful of not just the cool water, but making sure they get some sort of time to get out of the sun for a bit, and we can make sure. Because if you're not doing this, what I find is it's hard for supervisors. If we're not doing a cool down period and having a small conversation with the employee, just as small to make sure they're, they're, all their senses are registering, this is a tough one. I've seen people in heat exposure where you're looking at them saying, how are you? And they're like, I'm good. Uh, where are we at? And they can't answer. They're, 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 they look normal. But once you start to talk to them, their brain is not firing on all cylinders and they're getting really close to bad news. And that's really a good time just to go, hey, how are you guys doing? Everybody okay? Where are you going tonight? Now, you haven't done it. Is your girlfriend, your wife, your husband, your boyfriend, whatever. You're just asking general questions to really get a sense of them. Are their brain firing on all cylinders? They're not picking up a tool and because they're going to want to push through this to make you happy. And, and, and if you're not really staying on top of it, there's just no way you can see all the signs and symptoms. There's just not unless you're having a few conversations. Yes. And if you are uh, a company that does do work in California, and if you haven't uh, been with Got Safety since 2015, when they had the last major changes to regulations, we did a webinar that really got into the nitty gritty of yes. the California uh, regulations that you might go back, you can do a 2015 uh, heat illness update. You'll probably find it on YouTube or in your client center. You can get more details on all that stuff as well. Yeah. So as we move along, emergency procedures, Michael. These emergency procedures, you've got to have something in place so that you can know it. I recommend emergency procedures. You've got to have something with electrolytes, something with the electric lights so that if you're having somebody that's starting to shut down, you got to get them some water, maybe something that can be a bit more fast acting. Know where the emergency facilities are. Know where the hospitals are. Have your guys, some sort of person on the work site, either it's construction or even in a facility. Make sure people know what to do. Say, if somebody is having heat procedures, we are going to call nine. One one. That is our company policy. Or you can say you're going to make an assessment. I can only tell you what we do. So in God's safety, if we have somebody that is suffering from heat exhaustion, we call the ambulance. We just call 911. And I'll be honest with you. The reason why I do that is because I don't want to take on the liability of making the choice. And then maybe it's worse than I thought it was or, or we mess up in some fashion. So I take all the precautions to make sure we're heat. Our guys have cool down periods. They get out of the sun. They don't stay out there very long because of the nature of our job. We can work around those things maybe better than others. But you've got to make sure you guys know who to contact in the event of emergency, what to do in this specific emergency because most of the time our emergency procedure training we say these vague things to our employees we say okay in the event of emergency call 911 now that's true and i'm not knocking that but what i'm suggesting to you is you've got to get real specific sometimes if somebody has broken their arm and it's cut off call 911 but if somebody's having heat exhaustion what do you want them to do? Do you want them to take them to this area, get an assessment, wait for them to pass out before you call 911? You may want to think about a little bit more detail of what you guys are prepared to wait for and what you want to wait for when somebody is suffering from something like this so that you can at least tell the supervisors in your facility, the leads, the foreman, or what we've got going on. Just a heads up. Exactly. So that's it on the, the heat illness portion yeah. of it. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, required 
safety program documentation. So we mentioned in California and in yes. Washington, there are currently heat standards in place that require you to have a program. So yeah. there are, so in, but in addition to that, and for those of you that uh, are in other areas that don't require that program, there are still other programs that, that you need to have and you need to make sure that they are specific to your company. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that and, and what you need to have and, and how to determine that and make sure that you have what you need. So we're going to talk about the difference between training and programs, mm -hmm. what requires a company to have certain programs, yep. and what makes those customized for those companies. Um, and some of the common mistakes that we see when we review uh, people's documentation and some best practices for creating documentation. So, Michael, first, why don't you talk a little bit about basically the difference between training and programs and training on programs and, and yeah. so forth, if you would, please. So safety professionals love to create programs. Sometimes when you're doing it as a safety professional, either you're on on-site or you're a subcontractor, what they like to do is they like to create a program for everything that has to do with safety. This is really a, uh, a weak person, a weak part of the problem to build a safety program. It makes it, I call it a weak foundation because you don't know what is required, what is not required, and you're not really doing it in the right way. So I'll give you an example. On the far left, you see a program called heat illness. So in California, you got to have a heat illness program, right? But right above that, we have a safety lesson in golf cart safety. There is no safety program required for golf cart safety. But if your employees are working on transporting and utilizing golf carts, you should have training and thus a lesson plan that we put together for the training that you can have them train, you save, and we can document the, the points that we've done training. This points out two things. First, if you're going to do safety training, you need and want a lesson plan. Because if something comes back later and we need to prove what they were trained on, you cannot just be creating it out of thin air saying, well, Bob was trained on these things and we believe we talked about one, two, and three. No, this is the key spot to a lesson. But we never want to create a golf cart safety program because it's, it's not required. There's a lot of information in there and it's just more stuff that we can be cited on. Heat gun safety is a lesson only, no training. Knife safety, good example, Rick, lesson only, no training. But the last one here, it does correlate, doesn't it? The you mean no programs, I'm sorry. Right, no programs. Uh, yes, Rick, I apologize. No programs on the first three. But the last one is a lockout tagout, and that one does have a program. So there are some of the trainings that require a program and a training, and the program will lay out how everything should be put into play. We write programs when the OSHA system requires them, or there is some sort of special need to be able to have some sort of major program. So that is the difference between programs and training, sir. All right. So... What is it that requires a company to have the, to have those certain programs? What programs they're going to need? Well, every company does different things for work, and even if you're in the same industry, you may have different processes that create different programs. Here's a list of some of the required programs that OSHA requires across the country. From an injury illness prevention plan in many states, a COVID, a, a code of safe practice, COVID-19 programs are required in some states, confined space. You can see that there is a host of programs that are required, and these programs must be written specifically for the company and make sure they are tailored to the company, industry, and location. And frankly, that is our expertise, Rick. So what, so what is it that makes these, uh, these programs specific to a company? For example, you, you look at the two that I have listed here, the lockout, tagout, and, and the heat illness. How is it that one's gonna be specific to a company? So looking at these two programs, it, the, these are great examples, Rick, that you picked. The heat illness has a, has a lot of things that have to be specific with regards to how you're going to provide sh cool down sh shelters, how you're going to replenish water, how you're going to utilize and implement this. And so there are major spots to the heat illness program that if you try to download it online and just go, all right, we're going to do a fill in the blanks, sometimes it works well and sometimes it doesn't. I always say that if we're looking for bulletproof, you better have this written by some sort of professional that knows what they're doing. If you're not looking for bulletproof, I guess you can buy, pay the $39.99 or whatever they're charging to download some sort of rubber stamp book that I can tell you that in the event of a strange problem, something heavy, 
It's not going to hold. Lockout tagout is even easier uh, to understand because every equipment there that needs a lockout tagout has to be specifically written. You have to have lockout procedures specifically for that machine. Sometimes machines have the same three steps. And so in that perspective, what you would do is you've got to have three individual sheets with three individual names. That would be the proper way to do it, especially when you're looking to protect yourself or help uh, uh, companies and employees to understand what they're really looking at and how they pull that off. But those are two examples of how, when it comes to certain programs, why you need them customized and tailored. So obviously a lot of the rules, the rule itself mm. is the same. Like the, yes. like I talked about the 80 degree rule, uh, but how yes. you're going to do some of these things is now yeah. that's where the customization is coming into place. And, and you have the same rules and regulations, but it's custom and made to you by how you're going to implement some of these things. And our documentation team can update your books at any time at no charge, especially when you're a client of ours like you guys are. You're, you're really wanting us to do the book so that you can say, hey, we've got this process that's changed. We've got this and we can help you through it. And depending on what you're sitting in, either the state versus the federal plans, I mean, here is a listing of states and federal plans. So in the state plans, that's a list of the states that you can see. Now, I'm sitting right now in the great state of Utah, but California, Alaska, Wyoming, Washington, they all have their individual state plans. And those are what makes us experts in what we do. We track all this stuff and know all the regulations. On a federal perspective, okay, you're a little easier. Not bad because we just group you together. We know what you're doing. But those still have to be customized and created around what your practices, your procedures, your location, and the little details that may be different in your industry than somebody else. Yep. And if you live in one of those uh, handful of states in that bottom category there, um, they are actually for all intents and purposes, the same as federal, because unless you're working for a state or local government uh, agency who is then covered under a state plan specific to them, every other private business is going to fall under the umbrella of federal plans. So that's yeah, another yeah. part of, of what really makes making sure that your documentation is customized to you. Uh, we've seen instances where we've had clients uh, ha that wanted us to review their previous programs and maybe they've had them supplied through someone like a, a, a payroll company. And though they tend to, usually when we see those, we find that they're writing their stuff to federal standards, which is great if you're in one of those federal states. But right. if you're in one of the state plan states up above and your I mean, documentation references codes that, that start, what is it, Michael, 1900? Is that the federal codes? Uh, 1911, you know, those kinds of things, 1900. When you get to those kind of codes, you're 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 not even in the same ballpark. Especially if you're a state plan shop, your your program will be deemed to be not updated and insufficient. Exactly. So you want to make sure if you do, are getting something from a source like that, that you're checking to see what type of codes that they're writing it to, that they're to your state plan. That's you know that has another great part of making sure that it is customized for you. Um, so we, in addition to creating your documentation for you, we have help on the customizing and implementation portions in that. So you see on the left side of the screen here, we have basically an attachment that we send you that shows you a, based off of what programs that your company has, what appendix appendices need to be filled out in order to make sure that that you're in compliance so a lot of these things are like michael had talked about how certain things are going to be done so these yep. need to be filled out to to make it complete so we provide you with all of the resources all of those are in the programs yep. so that you can know what you you need to do and then more importantly we even have these management lessons that kind of tell you what you need to do to implement that program so it really gives your supervisor and managers all the information that they need to be able to yep. implement these programs and make sure that you have all of this stuff uh, correct and up to date. And then, of course, we're always available to answer your questions. You can talk, call here, and our manager, Sam Crawley, yep. be happy to go through any of this stuff with you and really make sure that all of your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted and that you're, yep. you really have this specific and custom to your company and that, that we're, we're up to date with, with all of that. So, Michael, let's do the last piece here, uh, if you will. Common go, mistakes, you know, huh, Rick? Yes. 
so so the the on the left there there's a copy of a of a sample of what we often see when we're reviewing people's documentation and and some pitfalls and stuff and you kind of just if you could go over some of that no problem. Now, it's hard to believe this, guys, out there, but when sometimes people do with this, they say, you know what, we spent years writing our own documents. We do not want you guys to do our safety manuals and what. And I totally respect this process if you do. So if you are one of the few that has done and you're keeping your own manuals and you want like to update them and you are, you're bold and you have the time, here are some of the mistakes that we see happen all the time. First, the all-in-one documents, which always has missing components. The all-in-one documents means that when you ask for your safety manual, you're going to give them a book that is three inches thick. There are no tabs. Nothing is sectioned off. It is grouped together like an encyclopedia. This is one of the most common things that is insane. Because when you're hit by OSHA, we have a problem, and somebody says, let me see your lockout tagout program. Most of the people that in this business that are in that will just go, oh, just give them the safety plan. It's in there. And now you're making this person who's ever looking at it or even what's happening, it's so much information, ah, they just cite you and go down, down the ways. Responsible person by job title. You really want to know who the responsible person is and what their job title is. You've got to put that in there. It is a key spot to writing safety manuals. Company policies. Company policies should be kept out of your safety manuals. You got to just picture this. When you create a documentation that is up to Fed and state OSHA productions, these programs must be written up to code specifically, and they are really making sure we're as specific as we can, but not too specific. Because if it is that Bob Johns is going to take a, a gallon of water every 15 minutes and take it to truck five, let's say that's the procedure we're going to put in. That's too specific. What if it's not John? What if it's Joe? What if it's Rick? What if it's somebody else? Now, that's a ridiculous example, I know. But understand that when you create safety manuals that are so rigid and so specific, because you're really trying to show what a great safety company you are or what, or what a great company you are. This also creates a problem that is such a noose that the programs usually will hang you on the other side of this. So we've got to get specific, but I know this sounds ridiculous, but not too specific. Understand that company policies and HR policies do not belong in a safety manual. Those belong in an employee handbook that is a separate system altogether. Don't try to put those all together with vacation days and pay rates and safety. Just keep them separate right there. Also, the disciplinary program. You're going to want that in a separate spot. So that is something that is an HR that if you're not following safety things, here is the disciplinary program that we go through to make sure we are writing people up and all this. And when it comes to disciplinary programs, I always recommend the first step is never a verbal. Never put a verbal as your first disciplinary program. And the reason why is this we all know that the verbal will be two or three times, and it's difficult to document. Now, if you're going to document the verbal, okay, I guess a verbal's fine, but you're still documenting it. I mean, it is what it is. But make sure your disciplinary program starts with warnings, okay? I prefer written, but they always have to end with one, one way, termination of the employee. If it's a one, two, three strikes, you're out. If it's a one through ten strikes, you're out. It's, it's up to you. There is no regulation that tells us how much or less or less they have to be. Just do what you're comfortable with, but make sure that when you have that disciplinary program that you actually implement it, that you're actually following it. And so you may say, I've got a really good team. I'm going to go the extra mile to give them a lot of warnings, and I got it. But you may be some savages out there that are tough employers. They're going to, oh, three strikes you're out. I told you not to do that. You're dead three times. So you've got to really make that judgment on that side. But, Rick, those are some of the common mistakes that take place. On the left side, the table of contents, you can see a lot of programs right there, right? Some of those programs aren't even required, and, and they're just creating programs. This is an actual table of contents of, uh, of uh, some people that we've dealt with. Uh, not one company, but just a hodgepodge of a collection of a lot of different things. And this really is some of the programs that they write and they put down there, right? Uh, there is a program I see at the bottom called a garden tractor safety rules. That's not a program. That's a lesson. That's, a, that's something that you would put together in a lesson. So you got to be cautious of just creating documents to create documents. And that's what we're here for, to show you how to put this all together. Yep. All right. Well, that's that's all the information. We will 
as you know, we like to keep yeah. uh, these presentations somewhat concise. We know you guys yes. got businesses to run, we so we want to get you information and you're busy. So uh, if, if you have any questions, uh, hopefully you've been putting them in the chat. But if you while we're answering the first few, uh, you can type away. And again, just a reminder for those of you that do have operations uh, in California, we're doing an update on the new COVID-19 uh, restrictions, some of which are being lifted, yeah. which will be fantastic. We're doing that tomorrow. If you did not get an invite tomorrow. for that, you can send me an email, rick at gotsafety.com. Happy to send you that link. But yep. Haven, uh, what do we have for questions, my friend? We do got six or seven questions here, but just keep typing them in and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Okay. Um, the first one is asking about if there's specific guidelines, how much they have to provide. They're providing two gallons. Is that enough? Two gallons of water per day? Is that the question? Well, it just says their water jugs are two gallons. Uh, what, what more? So we're talking about a, a quart of water per, what is it, Rick? A quart per, per hour? Per hour per employee. So you figure, yeah. so that would be what? Uh, that's two gallons a day per employee that's working eight hours. Yeah. So if the question is that, the answer would be yes. Your two gallons per employee per day will work just fine. The question is now it's got to be reasonably cool, clean, and pure. <laughs> so if you take these two jugs and just say, here's a two gallons, good luck. Now, it may be clean and it may be pure, but it's going to be hard to define suitably cool, which, trust me, we've gone the racket over with OSHA what suitably cool means, right? I, I, I still have yet come up with an exact temperature that makes people sufficiently happy. Let's be honest. It's a tough one. But that's what we get paid to do, have that friendly discussion with our wonderful counterparts, the great people of Fed and State OSHA. God bless them. So, yeah, that's the answer to that question there, Haven. All right. Um, does providing water include, do they got to do it at the job site or if they just provide it at the shop? No, nope, they would have. <laughs> that's a good one. Well, they got to provide it where the employees are working, right? So if they provide it at the shop, congratulations. But once everybody leaves, eh, you're not providing water anymore, right? I mean, you're not saying they have to drive all the way back to the shop. But if your now question is, it's their right, it's their job to be able to have some container that they take and go with. Uh, that's a tough one. Because remember, your job is to make sure it's clean, pure, and suitably cool. So if you provided that in the morning and somehow it wasn't cool by the afternoon, technically you're on the hook, not the employee. And that is a tough one about what you're asking there. So those are the answers to that. Yeah. And if, if you're giving a guy who's coming into the yard in the morning and saying, yeah, here, here's your, you know, X amount of bottles of water, mm -hmm. go good luck to you as you go out in the day, it makes it tough, tough on the supervisor to make sure that did he bring it? Did he drop it somewhere? Yeah. Yeah. You got to have it there, I would right, say. Right. It's tough. So this question follows along that same line, though. This employer uses um, hose water. Does that count as fresh and pure? You know, as a child, I drink hose water all the time. I think, and Rick did too. This is why we're both bald and uh, and uh, old looking. The, old, uh, the uh, hose water is scientifically proven to make you bald. So let me tell you, you can't use hose water. No, I kid. Uh, you can't use hose water. Now, listen, it's pure clean and suitably cool. Now, I'm not saying to you that the water comes out of your hose is not potable. I'm just saying this. There is no code that says you can or cannot, really. So let me backtrack and say there's no code that says you can't use hose water. What I'm suggesting to you is clean, pure, and suitably cool. So if you want to take hose water, fill up a jug full of ice, and that's your thing. You may have clean hose water. What do I know? I, I, I don't know the kind of hose. I mean, is the hose, hose something you're flushing out the Andy Gumps with? Okay, that may not be a good hose to use. Is it construction hose that's laying in the dirt and uh, not trying to get crude, but the spit of everybody, all the construction guys chewing tobacco? I it really is a tough one that you're asking. So in general speaking, it's not my first go-to, but if you've got a somehow clean and pure hose and the water that comes out you believe is clean and pure, then my gosh, uh, who am I to tell you can't use hose water? But man, that's a good one. That is a good one. <laughs> okay. So that, yeah. I got another gal here. She, um, 
So she provides filtered water to her employees, but she's got a couple who don't like the taste of it. Does she need okay. to reimburse them for what no, they spend no, on money? I, I, I reject these people at the highest level. Listen, you're, you're getting into a source. That, listen, I provide at the office uh, Arrowhead water, right? Because I've had a few people, I don't like this taste. I don't like that taste. Let me just tell you. Yeah, I think the rest of us on this webinar are laughing at this question. Now, I think it's a real question. I'm not saying the asking of it is not good. I'm saying that the difficulty and the pickiness of our employees, you just got to tell them to get over it. I don't know what you want me to do on the taste. Listen, this isn't a restaurant. You don't get to pick. You don't like salmon. You want a beef? Okay, this isn't like picking chicken dinners. I got water for you. It's cool. Now, if, if the water is basically pool water, all right, maybe they don't like the taste. But if it's like, no, this is like water. It's fine. It's purified. They just don't like the taste. I don't care. And then they can pound it. I really don't care. That one, I would tell that employee, they're tough. That's a tough one. And No, do not reimburse them at the sheer principle of it. It would irritate me for you to reimburse them. But you could be a good person. You could be a better person than Rick and I, and you could do them. <laughs> and not that I, I do nice things for my employees, but, yeah, I'm not having a reimbursement because you prefer Aquafina over, you know, uh, you know something maybe else. Maybe water. Oh, do not boss it. I mean, that's the glass bottle, right, Rick? I mean, come on. Jeez, Louise. You buy that smart bottle. I swear they're selling that thing for two or three bucks a bo- for a bottle of water. More than gas. <laughs> All right. Luckily, that was the last water question. Oh, my we got God. A couple here. <laughs> we got a couple here on shade. Um, Bring it to us. If, a, if their crew is working in an area with lots of shade, is a pop-up still required? And the next one is, do vehicles count as providing shade? No, if you have shade, and it, and once you get into the shade conversation, with, is this shade? Is that shade? Listen, if it's shady and cooler there than it is in the direct sun, then that is shade. Your car does not suffice because a car is not cooler than in the sun, unless you're running the AC. But now you'd have to make the argument, well, the employee needed it. It was 10 minutes for the car to cool down, 20 minutes to get it to cool down, because you're not driving around the block getting it cool and then coming back because if you do that you're taking the shade from the job site of the other employees so the car is a very difficult one to get to i've seen this issue come up a number of times and in the state of california i have never seen a car hold in a hearing setting that it sufficed for shade so there is no rule that says you can't but i'm suggesting that when in front of a judge and the district is testifying there are too many weird loopholes and what ifs about the car had did it have to leave was it running 20 i mean the 8 hours of the shift the cool i mean there's just a lot of things a car would be a hard bet to have but if there's existing structures the far first part of the the question yes yeah. they're fine as, as long as as long as you know they're going to have shade throughout the day right once the sun moves and the it's directly overhead and now the the the, the tree's not casting a shadow anymore you, you got to make sure you got enough shade yeah, I, 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 and Rick is right. I'm leery of a tree because you, it, it's got to hold a decent percentage of your employees. And when you have a tree and everybody's gathered around, uh, unless you're talking a sprawling oak tree or shade right. tree that is substantial, don't give me some sort of uh, Palmdale desert bush that uh, that if you hunch down just right and you lay in a in an L fashion, you can get some shade. Please, God bless you, people. Don't be doing things like that. That's weird. Yeah. So. When speaking about that cool down period, is the 10 minute cool down in addition to mandated rest breaks? Well, the 10 minute cool down is really that in the high heat procedures where you've got to be given in California when it's above 95, you have to give them a a 10 minute break minimally every two hours. So that, yes, that could be considered. And in general, their cool down, it, it doesn't even if, you know, if in two hours it's lunchtime, then that's his 10 minutes to go cool down. I mean, he's going to have a half hour or an hour lunch. It can be around break, uh, regular scheduled breaks as well. You just need yeah. to make sure when you're in high heat that every two hour, that they're not working more than two hours solid and, and not getting a break and, and being able to rest yeah. in the shade. Yeah, yeah, Rich, right. All right, this one's a little longer question. So he realizes that California is still using – the uh, OSHA is saying to not have fans blow air from one employee to the other. So how can he keep employees cool without using fans and any idea how long the restrictions are in effect? 
Ah. You're asking is you're asking the impossible question. This is really when when COVID in California yes. is going to come back to, to we're going to be done, and nobody can answer that question. That that question, you are damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't, kind of an answer. But I do see the insanity of blowing air from one employee to the next, where they're all. <laughs> now tomorrow we're doing the now. It just we don't usually do two webinars in the same week. I mean, it's a lot. I mean, how how long can you really look at these two guys? I mean that. That really is the complaint we get more that we're we're torturing you by us. But the reality of it is tomorrow we have a guest speaker coming in. He is my brother. His name is Steve Crawley, and he is not just a gorgeous specimen of a human being, but he is as knowledgeable as anybody. You're going to have a lot of fun with it. But they're going to cover the standards that literally came out a few days ago. They're going to cover what is happening with COVID and covering those. But the answer to your fan question you're going to save that question for an impossible answer, which you, you got to cool them down. But yes, if you're blowing COVID from one guy to the other, it does. <laughs> it's a little bit you, of a you problem. Know, you, can, you can put a mask on the fan, I guess. I mean, that's as intelligent of an answer as any other one I could give you, which would be good because the diseases go, I ah, forget the mask on the fan. Just do this. You've only probably got a few more months of the insanity. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not a fortune cookie, so we'll have to be able to tell. So I can't answer that one. Sorry, guys. That's a tough one. Hey, what else you got over there, bud? Is there a specific temperature you guys mentioned that they need to provide the water to their employees when they I should can't... start providing? Uh... Well, 80 degrees is is the, the heat standards yeah. regulation. But, boy, I I would say you, you got to have water all the time, right? Just because it's 75 doesn't mean I don't need water at the job site. Yeah, and so the question is, if you're like, man, I, I don't want to have to buy the water and do it, but I want them to work there. Uh, you know, I would say it's a good idea to provide water to your employees while they work. That's probably a good idea. It's like providing bathrooms, right? It, it, it's a good idea. It's going to make people more convenient. I'm not saying buy them all a case of beer. I'm just saying, you know, it seems like a low thing to have to provide people. Just provide them water, people. I mean, come on. If that's all my employees needed, I'd be better off. They like energy drinks and all this other stuff than ice cream. Three o'clock ice cream hour here in the office. It's a real thing. It's crazy. <laughs> and the last question I got here, is there an indoor maximum temperature? Um, they're working in sometimes three, four hours in houses without air conditioning. Is there any guidelines on indoor temperatures? Well, the indoor temperature really, it, it, there really is not a standard that's come out anywhere in the in the country for high heat indoor standards and whatnot. But you have to make sure you're clear on this. If you have employees working in the shade and they have some sort of heat illness problem where they're dehydrated or they die or there's something, you can bet your bottom line that the money is going to come out of your back pocket. Now, it may not be a citable thing, but you've just got to know that if you have guys working in a house that's 95 to 100 degrees and they're in there and they're, the wind is being blocked by plywood or whatnot, just know that there may not be a standard for that at this point, but, and COVID has delayed whatever standard they were trying to get into play. But just know we're going to be held to the fire. It would be cited under a general code of unsafe work conditions. And you're not going to convince an indoor judge who works indoors, who wears a black robe, that somehow this person working in a high heat circumstance and you didn't provide water or didn't give them cool or didn't watch them or didn't supervise them and died it was not your fault. That's going to be a tough sell, in my opinion. But uh, you may be a better debater than me maybe i don't know all right haven what you got next i got one more question but for there's a lot of people asking some of the same questions the download should be available if you click on the files button in webinar yep. jam they're all available for download right now did you put the presentation in as well i Even? did i stuck that up just barely Okay. And then um, we will be we email links to the presentation tomorrow after after we get it up on youtube and then this is a pretty valid question, though. What temperature does the water itself need to be? Does Is there anywhere it says that? Don't ask that. Don't ask that question <laughs> because now Suitably it's cool. bad news. Listen, suitably cool is what they said just to irritate us. But I have had this debate with inspectors because suitably cool is just different, right? If it's 115 outside, 
80 degree water pretty tastes pretty dang cool to me sometimes, right? But but oh, here's the deal: suitably cool is where you have to go. You're wanting a temperature read. No, you're not getting it, and they don't have it. And I'm certainly not going to suggest you one because once you do that's the number we have to go with. And so you just get to be in the vague world of Fed and State OSHA with suitably, suitably cool. You could take a, a consensus with the people in, in your office. That may be a fun hour to kill. Just get a lot of different temperatures of water, pass it around, say, which one is suitably cool? That may be fun, but basically there's nowhere else to go. Suitably cool, people. Suitably cool. Anything else, Haven? That's it. We can end with that one. Hey, uh, Rick, what do you have to say, my friend? Well, just a reminder, as Haven just said, we will have uh, the replay link coming out to you. It will be available on YouTube. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well and get notified when we, when these postings come out. Uh, other than that, uh, hopefully we'll be able to see you tomorrow. And, Michael, go ahead and close us out. Uh, tomorrow with the webinar, Steve Crawley will be the uh, guest speaker there. I have some things that I've got to take care of that have come up with some family stuff. We are very grateful for you attending today. God bless you for coming out today. If you need anything, our customer service team here in the office is standing by. We are Rick and Michael uh, doing the Got Safety webinar thing, trying to keep you safe, and we will see you guys next time. Thanks for coming.